Welcome to Cordell and Cordell's Men's Divorce Podcast, moderated by managing partner and CEO Scott Trout, bringing you information for guys before, during, and after divorce, and everything related to family law. This podcast is not to be taken as legal advice, and no attorney-client relationship is established. Welcome back to the Men's Divorce Podcast, as usual. I'm Scott Trout, Managing Partner, CEO of Cordell and Cordell, and we're always here to bring you the latest information, information about divorce, before, during, and after, anything relative to it, try to bring you something different and new uh, to educate you, as always. It's not legal advice. We can't give, give that to you right here on the podcast. That is best served through a consultation with an attorney who practices exclusively in family law, like we do here at CordellCordell.com. That's where you want to go. 866-DADS-LAW. That's what you want to call. If you want a consultation, we can do that just like this on video, in person, on the phone, whatever is most appropriate and convenient for you. So check us out at CordellCordell.com. I'm joined by Robert up in Indianapolis. Welcome. Hi there. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, let's talk about something again. We haven't talked about this. It's uh, I've been saying I've been looking for topics that we haven't done in, since you know we started this in February of 2020, now two and a half years we've been doing this and uh, trying to find unique topics to present to our viewers. And this is one of them, uh, Child Protective Services. It's known by different names throughout the country. It could be, for example, here in Missouri, it's DFS, Division of Family Services. Uh, it's very different, but let's kind of Break it down for everyone watching. What is CPS or Child Protective Services? Yeah, so as, as you say, it does definitely go by by different acronyms. Um, you know, here in Indiana, it, it's uh, Department of Child Services, um, and it actually used to be CPS. So it can even change within your state uh, what the actual acronym is. I'm going to use uh, CPS um, for the rest of this podcast, just um, because I think that's the more more general term. But essentially, it's it's usually within um, the Department of, of Family Services in your state. And the whole job there is protecting children, uh, protecting children from abuse and neglect. Um, and a lot of times that means getting involved in uh, families and having to, uh, to do some investigation into, into families. And it can be very invasive. Um, and so it's a good topic to, to know something about. Um, you, know, you don't think that you'll ever be involved in a, a CPS case. Uh, until you are. And, and so it's a good thing to have uh, some sense of how it works and, um, and what those are about. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely one that needs to be on the radar. Um, you know, I've been doing this almost 30 years and, you know, early in my career, I had some involvement with, with DFS, CPS, Child Protective Services. And I've always said, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you certainly don't want them involved in your case. Uh, usually it's either a sign that something's going on or, Worse, nothing's going on, but they're in your case, and it really becomes a disaster to deal with uh, because there's a whole host of issues. I mean, generally, um, do you have you find that there's just a general issue with CPS in terms of you know being overwhelmed or what you know what is kind of going on? What do you see you know when they become in, integrated in your life or in your system or in, in the case that's going on? You know, is there's this general problem with CPS? Yeah, uh, you know, nationwide, um, we are are experiencing in the U.S. a a bit of a crisis with uh, child protective services. I'm going to throw some some numbers at you here, Scott, because it gives a, a better sense of of what's really going on, and then we can talk about you know how that actually affects most of these uh, departments. So for the year 2020, um, there were three million nine hundred and twenty five thousand reports of child abuse and neglect involving 7,100,000 total children. And uh, to kind of put that in, in context, there are about 73 million children in the U.S. So we're talking about 1% of all kids across the U.S. were involved in a report to a CPS. Um, and about half of those get substantiated. So we're, we're talking about a lot of kids that, that are involved in this. Um, and that, that it turns out CPS decides... Um, you know, have an issue that needs to be brought to the courts and have, um, you know, something that, that needs to be addressed in terms of child safety. Um, some more numbers, about two thirds of the reports come from 
Um, and, and I was actually a little bit surprised to learn this, even though I've had a, a lot of history um, with, with working for and against DCS. But about two thirds of the reports come from professionals. And when I say professionals, we're talking about law enforcement agents, teachers, medical personnel, which leaves only a small percentage of them that come from the, uh, the public. Interesting. The mandatory yeah. reporters, the ones that have exactly, to yeah, we call them mandatory reporters. That's that's our professional set. Those those police, teachers, and medical personnel, um, they're the ones making a lot of these reports, which helps to explain how about half of them uh, end up getting substantiated. Other thing I found to be interesting was that um, men and women are nearly equally likely to be the one um, to be found to be abusing or neglecting the child. Um, you know, I could see certainly reasons why it might be one or, or the other. Um, and as a firm that focuses on representing men, I thought it was interesting to, to know that it's, it's really both sides. And about 77% of the uh, ones found to be the abuser or neglector are the parent of the child. So not, not a babysitter, not a caregiver, not a step parent or something like that. Um, but, um, or I'm sorry, I shouldn't say a step parent, but that, that would qualify as a parent. But in other words, um, not somebody who's, who's in the child's life in a different role than, than as the parent. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's a pretty huge national problem um, as you can kind of see from the numbers there. Yeah. Uh, and the, the biggest causes right now are substance abuse and domestic violence. Um, here in Indiana, we've got a, an absolutely huge epidemic with uh, substance abuse, and that's what's causing a lot of the, a lot of the problems, especially in our more rural areas. Um, but domestic violence also, um, you know, often tied in with substance abuse. That's one of the huge, huge background factors in, in the reason why we have so many calls and so many kids in the system. Yeah. I guess when you, you know, at first glance, when you mentioned that the numbers and it was a little surprising, you know, in terms of the difference between what we'll call the mandatory reporters. And, but then I think back and I'm thinking, okay, if there's, if, for example, in, in our business, you know, if it's 50, 50, you're going to make a report, like for example, uh, an ethics concern, right? Uh, I get it. Maybe they're going to say, you know what, to protect myself, I'm going to go ahead and report something, even though it may be tenuous at best. And that's where you may not get uh, a spouse who doesn't do it. Typically, I, you know, my ex my experience and my history and career, you look at it. And to me, a lot of it's used as a weapon when it is a spouse or you know a partner who's using it to try to get an advantage. Because uh, in some respects, they have these emergency powers, much like uh, an order of protection, adult abuse, domestic violence order, where you can get some relief immediately. And it is a little bit scary when, and I've told clients that is like, look, I don't want you to involve, you know, DFS from, even if we're using it as a sword and I don't certainly don't want to have to defend against it. And so it's just a very dangerous uh, path to go down unless you're left with no other avenue. Uh, but what do you do? You know, that's the question there. You're sitting here, gosh, I don't want CPS in my life. What do you do if they're involved and something happens and you get a, a phone call or a knock on the door and they show up? What do you do? Yeah, I, and I, I think that's that's a really good thing to to think about, um, you know, ahead of time before they're involved in your life. You know, first, I, I think it's important to think about, um, you know, the person in front of you that's working for CPS. Um, first thing to know is that because of all of these numbers um, and because of the the budgets that states usually um, a lot to CPS they are extremely overworked. You know, most caseworkers just have seriously, sometimes in the hundreds of kids that they are supposed to be responsible for and that they're checking in on. And when new reports come in, they've got to investigate those reports and they may have, you know, more kids that they're going to have to be responsible for. That results in very high turnover rates. So the caseworker that you may be faced with at your doorstep, um, you know, they may be very new. So this may not be something they're extremely practiced at. So it, it's good to know that sort of thing. And, and the attorneys that work for, for CPS also, um, you have that same issue, very high case rates um, in, in the high hundreds and also very high turnover rates. So it's not a good system overall. Uh, and I think that's nobody would argue with that, that, that nationwide. I don't know that there's a state that can say our CPS system is really working well. Yeah. The median response time nationwide from the time that a call comes in 
to the time they actually start their investigation is still 2.6 days, which, you know, you were just talking about it and, and you're right. It, 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 they do have a lot of powers they can wield quickly, but still 2.6 days to me seems insane that, you know, you would have this phone call, you would say this child is being abused and they might not see them for another several days. Right. It'd be no, like calling it obviously nine. depends on the type of case. You know, if you're alleging physical or sexual abuse, obviously they're going to prioritize those, but it's still a long time. And then I'll throw one more number at you. Uh, nationwide in, in 2019, which is the last time we had a survey of this, there were 672,000 kids in the foster care system, which again, that's nearly 1% of all the kids, um, you know, in the U.S., are currently at any given year are in the foster care system for at least some amount of time. You mentioned the 2.6 days and, and, and it is when I think it, it for perhaps we view this agency a little bit differently just because of our experience with them, but it is an urgency immediate situation where you're saying, I need this child, you know, they need help now. It'd mm-hmm. be as if we were to call 911 and the operator would say, okay, we'll respond to you in 2.6 days. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, well, yeah. there's a guy at my door who wants to hurt me. Right. But you know, there, it's just, it is a little bit shocking. It isn't uh, a pandemic, right. For CPS and that they are understaffed. They're liking it to uh, public defenders who are yes. historically understaffed, yep. overworked. And I think it lends itself to some mistakes. I do. I really feel like that's why um, I always caution to get them involved. I get it. Mm-hmm. They're overworked. They may make uh, snap decisions that may not be well thought out just because of the way that their caseload is there. It's not a, an indictment of the individual's handling it. It's just the system no. is broken. And so yeah. I guess that leads or lends itself to you know those listening and watching is, okay, I have an issue. What do I do? When do I call and when don't I call CPS? That's really the question. Yeah, and, and let me let me address your your previous question a, a bit ago, actually, because I think it's the most important thing I, I have to to tell our listeners here, um, and then we'll definitely talk about when to when to call and not call. When you have someone showing up at your doorstep from from CPS, don't take what I was saying a minute ago is to say that they are you know a, a, in any way a weak organization. The the laws that back CPS are extremely strong, and and as you said, they may have to make snap decisions. Um, but those decisions are going to carry a lot of weight. So when you have someone showing up at your doorstep and they, they say, you know, hey, I'm here from, from CPS and I, I have some questions about your kids. Um, what you want to do is take on a calm and civil way of, of interacting with them without being overly helpful. So you don't want to resist um, their investigation. You want to provide the information that they need. Um, but that doesn't mean that you want to help them. So for instance, most times that CPS shows up, they're not going to have a warrant to enter your property. They're going to have to go and get that from a judge separately, but they're going to ask to enter your property. They're going to ask to come into your house. They're going to ask to take a look at your kids. They're going to ask to talk to you about various things. And what you want to do is say, Hey, you know, I, I'm not trying to be difficult, but I've received some advice um, and I think that it would be best if I, if I didn't have you in my house, would you mind if we talked on the porch or how about, you know, I give, I come down to your office and we'll, we'll talk there or something like that. So if they don't have a warrant, politely decline to have them into your house. And that's a good um, way to think about everything else that you're doing with, with CPS. If they ask you a direct question, answer that direct question, but at the same time, don't offer more information than what they're, they're asking. Um, you should take notes uh, of everything that, that happens. You know, when they come, get yourself some, some note paper or take some notes on your phone. Uh, if they give you any documents, make sure you keep all of those documents uh, and that, of course, leads to, you know, what you know I'm going to recommend is get yourself a good attorney, somebody who specializes in CPS involvement, somebody who's doing um, family law exclusively. Talk to that attorney, provide all those documents, give them all of the notes. And um, to your best recollection, you recount what happened with DCS. Uh, there's a lot that an attorney can do for you in a CPS case that you can't do on your own. One of those um, that I'm always big on is, is interacting directly with the CPS attorneys. That's not something that most people can, can do is call up the department and, and expect to, to reach them directly. Um, but, you know, here at Cordell and at any law firm, we would 
quickly be able to reach out to that that CPS attorney, the either be the local attorney or the, the regional attorney in charge, and say, you know, hey, what's going on with this case? Give me everything you can. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I'll have to say about you know when DCS first gets involved in your case. If you get to the point where DCS has ordered you to do services and you've got a court order saying you need to do these services, whether it be because you want them out of your life or maybe they've, you know, they've taken your kids and you want to get your kids back, do those services promptly. Resisting those services is not a good way to uh, to win your case when it comes to CPS. So if you yeah. get far enough down the road, you're being ordered to do services, you really need to do those services yeah, I mean, it, it is, I mean, it's a, if anything in this podcast, we talk about the moment that perhaps you're being interviewed by a social worker, uh, someone from CPS, and it is, they have this aura of authority as if you must cooperate, that they can automatically come into your home, that you have to do whatever they say at that moment. And it is to me, it's, you, know, you pick up the phone, and you call your attorney and say, you know what, hold on, I just want to get my attorney on the phone, or, you know, now's not a good time. Can you come back? I, you know, you have the right to have this explained. This is why we do this podcast: is educational, informational, to inform you, to equip you to make those good decisions. And yeah. this is one of them because what you, you know, I always say it's it's like whatever you say and do will be used against you, no doubt. Uh, they are there to observe, and uh, you're not paying them uh, like you're paying your lawyer. Uh, your lawyer is there to work for you. Uh, the social worker there to investigate and perhaps not work with you, but try to secure your child, whatever's going on. And that's why I don't like those moments. Um, they're, you know, I panic a little bit because I want to be there with the client and say, you know what, my attorney's on the way. Why don't you just wait one right here? Uh, I think that's just key because, which leads into our final kind of thought as we go through CPS and is what happens here certainly can affect your divorce case and your uh, custody request, right? I mean, this is, it's all related and tied in, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So going back to your, your, your previous question about when to call DCS and, and when not to, um, I would strongly suggest most people who are, are thinking about calling DCS uh, or, or CPS, I should say, if you've got um, a custody case going on, I would strongly lean away from calling CPS. I'm going to talk about what what is legitimate abuse or, or neglect here in a moment, but I, I can't emphasize enough that the CPS is not a good tool to use in a divorce or in a custody case. So if you're thinking about whether you might want to call CPS just in your life in general, maybe you see, maybe you see something, you're at the movie theater and you see something you think might be child abuse, or you're, you hear something from one of your neighbors about something that, that might be um, considered neglect. First question I would, I would advise people to ask themselves is, is your focus about the child or is your focus about the caretaker? When your focus is about the child, then I, I would consider proceeding with a call to CPS. If you're mostly thinking about the um, abuser or the, the neglector and, and thinking about you know how you want to get them back or, or that you're angry at them for some other reason, that is not a good time to, to call CPS. So most people have a good sense of, of what child abuse is. You know, we're talking about physically um, being involved with a, with a child in a way that's, you know, it's not good for the child's well-being. But uh, neglect is something, you know, people are a little bit hazy about. So I'm going to read, uh, it's very short, the definition that we use here in Indiana. I think it's a good definition, and it's very similar to what you'll find in the laws in most states. Um, neglect is the inability or refusal by those responsible for the care, custody, and control of the child to provide, and this is the list that we, we often come back to every time in court, the necessary food, clothing, shelter, medical care, education, or supervision. So that's our six-part list. Food, clothing, shelter, medical care, education, or supervision that is necessary for the child's well-being. So if you're thinking about, you know, do I have a, a case where I should call CPS Think about it from that perspective. Take that list and say, which of these things is not being provided for the child? Um, and that'll help guide you as to whether or not it's, it's worthy of a, a CPS call. Yeah, I, I think of the way I explain it to some clients about whether to get them involved is very similar to the conversation I have about guardian and litem. Uh, those are the attorneys to, to come in your case, perhaps. And 
I, I want to control the case for the client as best as possible. And when you give that away by calling CPS or a guardian and inviting them into your case, you lose some control. The direction of the case may take an entire left turn. You know, the, the quickest point at the divorce is a straight line. And oftentimes divorce isn't, it's a left, it's a right, it's a U-turn, you run into a wall, but you don't want to voluntarily put those things in your way. And that, unless absolutely necessary. I mean, I know your gut reaction is, I'm calling CPS, I'm calling DPS, a DFS, and have that conversation with your attorney, make sure it's the best decision for your case. There are risks associated with it. You may lose control in terms of the way it should go. It may actually may cause more money to be spent because you have to now fight what you thought was going to help you uh, and it may hurt you. And I just think it, it is a, it's a word of caution. I think it's right. It's to, to really think twice. I know you're acting or trying to act in the best interest of your child or children. Uh, there are many more avenues that the emergency motions that we could be filing. Uh, and that's why it's important to seek counsel, uh, get the best advice about what to do. Uh, I've always said, and uh, we, we give seminars out, 10 stupidest mistakes guys make when facing divorce. And one of them, one of the things I say is uh, every action has a reaction in your case. What you may think is going to produce a positive result may not. And, and oftentimes without counsel does not. And so just make sure to take those steps. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a number of things that, that can happen when you are uh, trying to involve CPS in, in your divorce case. And, and like you say, a lot of parents think of it, you know, as leverage. They think, oh, I'll, I'll get CPS involved and, and that'll really, you know, um, you know, provide a strong arm in this. Uh, and they're not wrong in terms of the strength of, of CPS, but there's some things to think about. Um, first off, you know, when CPS gets involved in a case, uh, usually by statute, they've got to involve, uh, they've got to investigate, I should say, every parent. So if you're a parent of a child that's, you know, maybe um, let's say mom's got primary custody and you, the dad, don't have a lot of, of child time with them um, and you think, well, mom's not doing this or that, so I'm going to call CPS. Don't think that the investigation will stop at mom's house. They'll be coming to your house also. They're going to investigate you as well. So that's one thing. Number two, when CPS does go to um, you know that parent's house that you've complained about, um, you have to think, what is that parent going to say about you? And then most likely they're not going to you know, talk about only the things that they've done wrong. There will be complaints about your parenting as well. And suddenly that will also be a part of the investigation. Um, so like you said, it can quickly spin out of control. And that's not even talking about, you know, if you do make a fictitious claim in most states, including here in Indiana, that's a criminal charge that you could be facing. Yeah. So you want to think really hard um, about whether, you know, a civil custody battle that you've got going um, is the best tool or whether CPS should really be involved. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't mean they should never be involved. You know, I've certainly had cases where, um, you know, dad hasn't been that involved in, in the case and suddenly finds out that, you know, there's um, serious abuse happening in, in the, on mom's home, then absolutely, you know, if that's what's happening, you know, the custody case should not stop you from call, calling, D, uh, calling CPS. Right, right. I mean, it's like calling the police. You don't want to call them every argument that you have. Exactly. Uh, you call them when you need them. And I think the, the danger is calling when there's an allegation. Perhaps you have an allegation that mom is abusive, whether it's emotionally or physically. And if they find uh, that, that unsubstantiated, that can, that's a ripple effect as well, where it hurts your case. You know, good luck bringing that evidence before the judge, because I'm the other attorney and say, well, that was unsubstantiated, judge. Judge yeah. would probably rely on the social worker. So there, it is. It's just... It is kind of, a, I guess, you want to do good and, and you think, just make sure you uh, counsel before you act, making sure it's the right decision. So, Robert, great stuff today. I know we could go on for an hour talking about uh, CPS and when yep. to do it and how to handle it. But uh, I know guys will want to rewatch this and re-listen this podcast over and over just to make sure they're doing the right thing. But ultimately, schedule a consultation with people just uh -huh. like Robert. You can find them on our, our website, cordellcordell.com. So thanks for joining, Robert. Thanks so much, Scott. All right, continue to tune in to our podcast. You can subscribe on iTunes. You can be notified when it gets dropped or check us out on YouTube. We have the Cordell and Cordell YouTube channel. We find out or find all of the podcasts we've done, including our virtual town halls. It is filled with information that we've done over the last 
almost 30 months. So check us out and continue to tune in. And until next time, have a great week.